What will Helena Wayne, the daughter of Batman, discover as she digs deeper and deeper into a conspiracy that spans the entirety of the DC Universe's history? So then, at the end of The New Golden Age, we were introduced to a brand new version of Helena Wayne, daughter of Bruce Wayne Batman and Selina Kyle Catwoman. Bruce had been murdered while on the job, and his daughter would waste absolutely no time taking up the heroic mantle to try and get to the bottom of it. She solved that crime eight years ago, and wouldn't you know it, the specific surrounding the murder are almost exactly like the events of a 1970s Paul Levitt's adventure comic story wherein a sorcerer empowered a nobody criminal to murder Batman before eventually expiring himself. That was eight years ago now. And Helena is still doing the hero thing as the Huntress, only instead of having a Robin like her father would, instead her partner in crime fighting turns out to be none other than Solomon Grundy, who is still very much alive, or should I say, unalive in this situation situation and kicking in the near future. We also learn that in this future, Helena has gone out of her way to try and rebuild and reconvene the Justice Society of America, though as she notes, there are far fewer legacy characters in this future taking up old mantles. And because of that, she's really opened up the recruitment drive to let in the children and descendants of former supervillains, including Icicle Jr., the daughter of the Soviet Red Lantern, Gentleman Ghost, the Harlequin son, not to be confused confused with Harley Quinn's son, it's spelt differently, I know a lot of people in the comments section made that mistake in the last video, as well as old reliables like Karen Starr, the power girl who is really living up to her Karen name at the moment as she's had it up to here with all these damn former supervillains besmirching the memory of her once beloved team. Hell, not even Selina Kyle, the elderly Catwoman, likes the idea of her daughter Helena hanging out with this more roguish group of people. Helena says that she believes in second chances, that Bruce Bruce believed in second chances, and hell, if he didn't, she wouldn't even have been born in the first place. Ooh, take that former super thief mom. Currently, the Justice Society of America is working a murder investigation. One of their own, Khalid, Dr. Fate, has gone missing. And again, if you read the new Golden Age, you would know that someone or something has been murdering Dr. Fates across time and space. When the team does track Khalid down, unfortunately, they're too late. He's already dead, mummified, and stuffed inside a coffin at the city museum by someone who very much wanted him to be found. This person is ultimately revealed to be that strange red-headed individual who was traveling time and space and always seemed to be there when something important was happening in the history of the JSA. Commenters in my last video, given with the red hair and his time travel powers, they all jumped to the conclusion that this guy must be Perdegaton, an old John Broom villain from the 40s who often fought the JSA. And considering how in this issue he dispatches every member of this new JSA by making use of time, abilities, I'm gonna say, yeah, they were very much correct. Power Girl is the first to fall, with the red-headed stranger using his time abilities to speed up kryptonite infection to the point where she can be taken out with a simple Luger pistol, one that he claims he also used to kill Kennedy. Which, given that the new Golden Age also made a number of Watchmen references, I feel like this is one of those things we should probably keep in our minds moving forward. The rest of the JSA is also taken out in similarly grisly fashions. They have their old war wounds opened up again, some are simply aged into dust, Mist, descendant of an old Golden Age villain and apparently part of the Midnighter clan, gets it particularly bad with his own brain disease eating him alive. His final words also invoke the name Cosmo, which makes me believe he's talking about the Star Staff, but I could be wrong. Huntress tries her best to fight back, but it's clear that she's outpowered and outgunned in this situation. In fact, the only reason she herself doesn't melt away into dust is because Catwoman shows up to make the save at the last minute. Even though she actively swore the night before that she wasn't going to follow her daughter around anymore as she did superhero work moms, am I right? Selina also just so happens to throw her daughter a snow globe, which seems innocuous enough until you remember that Jeff Johns set up certain special snow globes used by the Time Masters in Flashpoint Beyond, which were capable of housing complete variant timelines within them, like the Flashpoint universe. Helena grabs one, and when she comes Two, she's in the 1940s, at the feet of the original Johnny Thunderbolt and his genie sidekick. And it's on that note right there, the comic comes to a close, everybody. So that was Justice Society issue number one, and I gotta say, I enjoyed it. I don't really know where it's going, but Jeff Johns has such a passion and appreciation for Golden Age DC stories and characters, the whole thing just feels kind of infectious, and I want to take the ride with this book. This also might be the biggest spotlight the Huntress has been given since, geez, I don't even know 
how long, God, since the end of the original Earth 2, maybe? The end of this issue also makes me wonder where this story takes place in relation to everything else in the current DC universe because of its use of the snow globes that can house timelines within them. Did Helena get taken to the real 1940s Golden Age DC universe, or is it just some other version that's being kept under glass? Will this all ultimately end up jiving with the end of Dark Crisis and the potential return of the Infinite Earth, or will any of that ultimately matter in the end? Again, can't say for certain a lot of this series and that new Stargirl book is shrouded in mystery, and I think a lot of the joy of those two series is reading and trying to unpack it for yourself. Overall, I'd feel comfortable giving this one an 8 out of 10. Again, there's a certain sort of DC fan out there for which this stuff is always going to be catnip. And after so many years of the JSA and its related characters kind of just collecting dust and not doing much at all, I'm happy to see those fans get a chance to eat so well here. This also seems to be a much happier, more invested, more self-actuated Jeff Johns than we got to see in that Flashpoint Beyond book, and I'm always grateful for that. Overall, I'd give this one another 8 out of 10. Hey there everyone, Cape Jewel again, and I want to thank you so much for watching to the end of the video. As always, if you liked what you see, be sure to like, subscribe, comment. It really helps drive engagement and helps me out too. Also, if you are a patron, which you can become for as little as a dollar a month, you will get exclusive content that no one else can ever see, and you'll get to see the Comic Multiverse podcast before anyone else too. You can check out all this and more down in the description. And until next time everyone, this has been Cape Jewel, and I'll see you all next time. Cheers.